Hello and welcome to the latest seminar from the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, supporting new approaches to improve health and tackle inequality. In this video cast, Sandro Galea, Dean and Robert A. Knox, Professor from the School of Public Health at Boston University, delivers this keynote presentation addressing priorities for research, education and practice agendas in the post-COVID-19 world. It was recorded via Zoom on the 31st of August 2021. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think there's a few people still filtering in, but we'll make a start in the interest of time. So we're a couple of minutes past the hour. Um, welcome all to this GCPH seminar. Uh, I'm Linda Fenton, consultant in public health in PHS. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome this afternoon, um, Sandra Galea, um, professor of public health and dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. Um, I will hand over to Professor Galea to take us through his talk uh, and then see you back here at three. Very good. Well, can you hear me okay? I presume you can. Please let yes, me know. Yes, that's coming through. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fenton. Thank you for um, um, uh, the introduction. And uh, thank you to uh, the Glasgow Center for Population Health for inviting me. It's really a delight to be here. I'm only sorry that I couldn't be there in person. I want to say thank you to uh, Dr. David Walsh, who is uh, uh, behind the scenes, who initially reached out to me and uh, with whom I've had uh, collaborations over the past decade. So let me share my slides. I presume you can see those, please let me know if you cannot. So uh, my talk is um, called Priorities for Post-COVID-19 Public Health. And uh, what I really want to talk about is I want to trace you through what has happened in the, in the COVID-19 era and, and where it leaves us and uh, how we need to think about public health going forward, um, offering some perspectives which uh, perhaps may not uh, may not be mainstream in terms of where we're at yet, but I'm fairly convinced we will eventually start grappling with. I will say by way of framing that I am uh, using American data in uh, my presentation simply because I know the data better, and uh, I have a uh, a policy of uh, not trying to uh, pretend to understand data and context in other countries where I'm invited to present. Um, I, I know that many of these things will be applicable to. Uh, Scotland as well. I know that some of the things will not be applicable to Scotland, but I think that's okay. I, uh, I imagine that the audience will be able to uh, sort of do its own calculation about what it is that I'm saying that matters to Scotland and does not matter to Scotland. So having said that, I will uh, dive in. I, I will start with uh, perhaps a, a um, unexpected start, which is uh, I want to talk about the fact that a lot went right during COVID-19. And I, I realized that uh, in being in the middle of uh, COVID-19, as Dr. Fenton mentioned, we, uh, I mean, you are at the um, highest number of cases you've had, a number of places, including the US, are at a, a fairly high number of cases right now. And uh, certainly for the past 18 months, it has not felt like anything has gone right. But I do think it's important to recognize that a lot has gone right during COVID-19, because I think that anchors our conversation about what did not go right uh, by acknowledging what went right. And let me just start by showing you this graph. This is from uh, data from New York City in uh, the United States uh, looking at uh, COVID in March of 2020. This is very early on in the epidemic. And uh, the um, gray bars are number of people admitted to hospital. This is from a complete cohort in one hospital system. And um, But what I really want you to look at is the blue lines, which are the, the dark blue and the sort of more aquamarine blue, which are mortality, one is adjusted, one is unadjusted. And the point I'm ma making from the slide is the dramatic drop in mortality from 25% in March of 2020 to just a little bit more than 5% and then to 5% in May, June. So this was essentially a um, four to five fold drop in mortality over the course of about three months. And uh, I think we take this for granted, but I do want to uh, emphasize that this was to my mind, a remarkable achievement of medicine that a disease which we had never seen before, really unknown pathogen, new pathogen, new set of presentations, and um, that we dropped in hospital mortality by about fourfold in about three months. I actually think it's pretty remarkable. There was um, a lot of scrambling in uh, care systems to figure out the best way to deal with uh, COVID patients. And it's probably that the drop in uh, mortality came about because of improved clinical experience, the growing use in hospitals of pharmacological treatments, things like remdesivir, steroids, and the cytokine treatments, and um, better known pharmacological treatments, things like proning, which is what I showed you in the previous picture. So I think this was a, um, a remarkable achievement of uh, medicine, a very quick adaptation to a um, previously um, un, uh, unrecognized disease, which I think is something that uh, 
it's important that we mark and we recognize. Of course, the ultimate thing that went right, has gone right during COVID is uh, vaccines. Uh, the first two vaccines were the Moderna and uh, Bio BioNTech uh, Pfizer vaccines, which were um, which have been extraordinarily effective. Uh, it's hard to remember at this point, but in uh, early fall of 2020, we were talking about, we hope that vaccines emerge, which are 70% effective. These were 90, 95% effective, which is quite remarkable. And it's really quite remarkable how quickly we got to these vaccines. This is uh, how long it typically takes us to get to vaccines. This is from uh, a uh, welcome uh, graph showing the vaccines typically cost half a billion dollars and take about 10 years. I will remind us that um, we went from, um, from novel pathogen to vaccine approval in about 10 months, which is just simply unheard of before COVID. Before COVID, the fastest time we had ever gone to um, um, uh, vaccine availability was with the mumps vaccine, which had taken three years. So um, it really shows what that we achieved great things technologically in the time of COVID. And of course, the mRNA technology, which was brand new technology, feels like it came out of nowhere. But I do think that um, it's important to recognize the point that, um, the, as, as is always the case, anything that came out of nowhere, there was a sudden unexpected uh, um, um, win it reflects decades of investment. This is from a paper uh, from a, um, a published from uh, Tübingen in Germany um, about developing mRNA technologies. This is 10 years old. This is 2012, this paper. And it has this line in it, which I really quite love, which says mRNA presents a promising vector that may well become the basis of a game-changing vaccine technology uh, platform. I don't know Dr. Schlacke, but I look forward to meeting him um, one of these days to congratulate him on his prescience, because that's exactly, of course, what mRNA actually became. But the point here is that... Um, we invested in the development of technologies, which then bore fruit. And uh, this is, becomes a theme that I'm going to come back to later because I will, of course, highlight what we have not invested in, which I think has become such a problem that has become. So starting off, we've done a lot of things right during COVID. And perhaps my point in actually reminding us that we've done a lot of things right is uh, serves two purposes. One is because I do not think it benefits us in public health to... Um, be unqualified Cassandras. I really don't think that that, uh, that benefits us. I think it, uh, it loses us uh, um, people listening to us when we need them to listen to us, number one. Number two, I think it's also important because what is going to happen after COVID, and we'll talk about this more at the end, is a doubling down on a lot of things to fix the things that went wrong. And what I anticipate to happen is a lot of doubling down on this stuff that went right. And I want to make sure that um, that this, the success, the successes do not blot out the other things that we need to do that are going to be much harder. And of course, a lot went wrong. Um, uh, so, so much went wrong. This is uh, a uh, map of the world, um, um, uh, world cases, uh, I think last week when I updated these slides. And um, this is the, um, um, uh, the global uh, pandemic uh, curve as to um, where the cases are, um, are happening around the world. And um, we, have, um, we have had about 4 million people who have uh, died from COVID around the world. That's probably an underestimate, of course. Meanwhile, we have, there's been um, an, a global effort to um, vaccinate people that has been uh, vastly unequal with uh, the countries of uh, Western Europe and uh, North America and uh, China and uh, who, that have been vaccinated while um, countries, essentially countries in Africa being um, very, very low vaccination rates. And um, just to bring it to home for me in the United States, just to give you a picture of uh, how the United States has felt, I'm sure this is quite similar to um, what you felt like in Scotland. This is from, um, um, uh, from the New York Times, which is one of our local newspapers. And um, this was uh, in uh, fall of 2020. The reason I show this map is because um, this was obviously when there was a lot of COVID going on, but the, I, I very much felt with this map when uh, the newspaper ran it that um, their choice of color made it feel like the whole country was a flame, right? It's a, it's a, you look at this, and um, without knowing what's going on, if you were just landing in the in, in the United States, not knowing anything's going on, you look at this map, you, you know that nothing good is happening, that uh, this can only be bad things that are happening. And uh, it really has felt for the past 18 months, and many times, like the whole country is a flame. This is our um, uh, epidemic curve in the United States, and, um, and uh, you can see sort of where we are uh, right now with the, with the sort of latter wave. And of course, all of this hides a um, fair bit more of mortality that we're currently not seeing. I mean, we are seeing it, but we're not, not paying attention to it. And uh, when all is said and done, we will pay much more attention to it. This is from our world and data. And uh, the um, red line looks at um, excess mortality compared to previous years. And you see this going from January 2020 
to January of 2021. And uh, what you see is this uh, tremendous increase in mortality from uh, that that is happening from a range of other causes, not just from COVID. Um, and uh, there are many other studies which I could point to that are beginning to um, recognize that in the time of COVID, we are um, beginning to see mortality um, um, that is emerging, um, that has been emerging due to a number of factors that really is resulted in, uh, in a shift in the global mortality picture that, was, that is unprecedented over the course of one year. In the United States, uh, COVID in 2020 is the third leading cause of death. So this is heart disease and cancer, numbers one and two, and you see them right here. This is from our National Vital Statistics System, and COVID is number three, became the third leading cause of death. Now, I say this right now, and um, I suspect that many in the audience are like, are, might be shrugging, it's like, okay, well, we know that, but um, let me give you a counterfactual. So we're sitting here in um, August of uh, 2021, and I'm here to tell you that um, unnamed disease X is going to be the third leading cause of death in uh, Scotland, in the United States, in um, 2023. And a disease that we have not heard of yet, you don't know its name, but it's coming in 2023, it'll be the third leading cause of death. When I say that, how does that make us feel? Right? It, it, it certainly fills me with a certain terror. Like, wait, 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 what is that disease? What's going to happen? How's that going to manifest? How is that uh, going to affect our daily life? Uh, who's going to get it? How is it going to affect our healthcare system? And uh, I actually think that 18 months into living with COVID sort of day in, day out as a world, almost two years into it, we've almost become inured to the fact that uh, this is pretty remarkable. It is actually pretty remarkable to have a new disease that previously nobody had heard of become the third leading cause of death in, in one year in the US. As I'm, I, again, I don't know the Scottish data, but I suspect it's very similar in Scotland as well. So this has a, resulted in, um, not surprisingly, a downturn in life expectancy. This is U.S. life expectancy. You see female, male, and the, and the total. And uh, you see this downturn in life expectancy. And the magnitude of downturn in life expectancy in the United States is um, the largest downturn in life expectancy that we've ever had since um, World War II. We had a, a, um, a, a bigger downturn in life expectancy in, uh, in World War II, in, in large part because um, there was a lot of young people who were dying um, in war. And while we talk about this in public health and in population health, I do want to point out that um, um, uh, in, in America, about 650,000 people have died. As I said, worldwide, we've had about 4 million people have died. And uh, in uh, public health and in, in the business of population health, which is the business that uh, I've been in in all my academic life, and um, many of you are also in, I do think that um, it's worth pausing and reflecting that um, each of those um, deaths is a, is a life. These are, um, these are people. These are people's so, mothers, sisters, brothers, cousins, friends, aunts, uncles. And um, so it's not uh, 650,000 people, it's not 650,000 population, it's 650,000 moms and sisters and brothers and uncles and aunts who have actually died. And uh, so I do think it's important to um, emphasize the depth of um, the tragedy that this has been in, um, in our countries. Now, come back to the United States, the um, tragedy has been compounded by the depth of inequality um, uh, with which um, that we have experienced the tragedy through. Um, this is um, data between Black Americans, White Americans, and uh, the, the um, red bar is adjusted. The um, blue bar is unadjusted, just focusing on the adjusted for a second. What you see is that Black Americans have had about a twofold greater risk of dying from COVID than have had White Americans. I'm gonna get to the reasons for that in a second. In fact, when you go back to the life expectancy, um, that I showed you earlier, I showed you the overall dip in life expectancy. But uh, this is life expectancy broken up in our major by gender in our in, a, in our larger racial ethnic groups in this country. And what you see is on the far left that black men in the U.S. have had a three-year drop in life expectancy with COVID, and um, at the far right, white women have had a 0.7 drop. Now, just to be clear, a 0.7 year drop in life expectancy is actually quite large already. Um, um, we have had. Um, drops in recent years in the United States due to our opioid epidemic in the 0.4 to 0.7 range. Um, uh, and we had been um, quite fretting and quite worrying about that, as we should have been. A three-year drop in life expectancy is really quite extraordinary. And it's particularly extraordinary because Black men are already the group, at least as divided by the major, by genders and by major race ethnicity groups, um, black men are the group that has the lowest that have the lowest life expectancy already in the United States, and uh, so that's the group that was particularly hardest hit. 
So a lot went wrong in the context of health and the health burden of, uh, of COVID. And uh, that is, to my mind, inextricable from um, what has gone wrong in terms of the social and economic context around COVID. Uh, in an effort to mitigate the effects of COVID, we have um, gone through lockdowns and through various efforts to um, contain economic function. And uh, that has, in this country, looked like this. We have had this um, precipitous drop in, um, in employment, which you see on the, on the right. And uh, we in the United States went down to employment levels that um, we had not seen since 1975. 1975 um, uh, in America was a time of, um, um, our president at the time was Jimmy Carter, um, uh, who famously coined the phrase uh, that uh, the country was going through a, a time of great malaise. That phrase, of course, cost him the next election um, um, because um, certainly Americans don't like hearing that they're going through malaise. But um, it, we um, achieved a kind of um, unemployment that we hadn't had in, uh, since in about 50 years. And um, that really characterized many other things. In much the same way that unemployment, um, in, in, I apologize, in much the same way that uh, the health burden of COVID was unevenly felt, the economic burdens of COVID have been tremendously unevenly felt in this country. So this looks at that unemployment and uh, divides into three groups. The red group is um, high, um, um, high income occupations. The aquamarine group is uh, middle, uh, middle wages and the dark blue group is low wages. So what you see is, um, this right here is uh, March, uh, April 2020. You see this drop in employment, which is what I showed you in the previous slide. But notice how among the high wage earners, um, employment had recovered fully, recovered fully by June of 2020. In fact, at this moment in time, employment in high wage earners is higher than it was pre-COVID. It is among the low wage earners, which is the dark blue line, which employment has not really recovered and remains about 20% below what it was in COVID, uh, before COVID. So in fact, when you compare um, job gain and loss in the highest income quarter, second income quarter, in fact, there's been a job gain since COVID. It's in only in the lower half of income, which is the third income quarter, lowest income quarter, that there's been a job loss in the time of COVID. In other words, it's been in uh, manual labor, in jobs and in, uh, in retails, in jobs in the service industry. That's where jobs have uh, disappeared in this country. And as you might expect, as you might expect that um, these jobs um, together with being socioeconomically patterned, they're also racially patterned. And uh, just to show you that, this is from our Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, this looks at Black, Asian, and white um, unemployment rates. And each of these graphs looks at pre-COVID recession, peak in the COVID recession, and current. And the current here is April, the income data in this country. Uh, the jobs data in this country always lag a few months behind. Uh, I'm not sure what they're like in Scotland. But um, looking at Black Americans, you see pre-recession unemployment was 6%. The peak was 16%. Current is about 10%. That's Black. Just compared to White, it was 3 um, before. Now it's about 5 So really, it was double before. It's still roughly double now between Black and White unemployment. But of course, double is at 10% Black employment, while uh, um, for White, it's about 5%. Looking at it by Latino, Hispanic, non-Hispanic. Again, pre-recession was five. Now it ends up about seven. Non-Hispanic is about 3.7. And now it's about four. And one can look at it in other ways, in other ways of social stratification. Um, looking at it by, by um, education, I find this very telling. Um, uh, pre-recession, people with less than a high school diploma was about 5.7%, up to 21. Current is 9.3%. People with a bachelor's degree or, or higher, which uh, tends to be sort of people in rooms like this. Um, Pre-recession was only about 2%, now it's only about 3.5%. So really, uh, unemployment in our social group is about um, one third of what it is among people with less than high school diploma, really making the point about how um, much of what's happened during COVID has been uh, disproportionately experienced. What makes this particularly sad in the context of COVID is that it doesn't always, it hasn't always been like this. And in previous recessions, we haven't seen this kind of social stratification. Um, this is uh, the, the last four recessions in the United States, 1990 recession, 2001, 2008, and the coronavirus recession. The green line here is the highest earning 25%. The purple line is the lowest earning 25%. The y-axis is employment. And what you see is in um, the previous three recessions, while there was some splaying, as perhaps might be expected, of um, employment um, in uh, different, uh, in the high earning versus low earning groups, it's nothing like the COVID recession. The COVID recession has had the most extraordinary separation in that 
it has essentially hit the lowest earning half a quarter and the lowest earning half of the population. That is the group that's been hit at unemployment. That's the group um, uh, that has uh, borne disproportionate burden of COVID as well as borne disproportionate burden of the economic consequence of COVID. In this country, that all contributed to um, the surge in um, extraordinary civil unrest that started in um, um, uh, June of 2020. Um, um, the, um, the civil unrest emerged after the um, police shooting of unarmed black men and women, but it really wasn't just that. That's actually why I'm showing this uh, picture because it talks about twin crises and surging anger convulsed the US. Uh, there were about 20 million people who participated in um, civil protests in the US in the summer of uh, 2020, which is the largest uh, civil protest that we've ever had as a country, much larger than, uh, for example, 1969. Um, and really, while the catalyst was the shooting of unarmed black men and women, it reflected a, um, it reflected a depth of um, inequities that were manifesting in COVID, manifesting economic con consequences of COVID, as, as I'm going to talk in a second, that reflected, men reflected underlying inequities that have been with American society for um, decades. So having said what went wrong, let's talk about why it went so wrong. Let's talk about why it all went so wrong. And, um, and, I, and I think the reason why we had these um, particularly these inequities in the experience of COVID is uh, twofold. I think that we had a um, unnecessary risk, differential risk of getting COVID and unnecessary differential risk of severe COVID. And I'm going to focus in the next uh, few slides on the black white differences in America. I could talk about Latino differences, Hispanic differences, talk about um, um, Native Americans, but just for ease, I'm focusing on the black white difference in, um, um, uh, in Americans. And I realize, again, I'm giving you American examples and I realize that uh, some of this has a uh, bearing for Scotland, some of it doesn't. I, knowing a little bit about uh, the Scottish situation, I think a fair bit of it actually has bearing to the Scottish situation, although on different dimensions than the particular racial dimensions that I'm mentioning here. So why was there this black white differences in uh, COVID mortality in the US. So, well, when, whenever we talk about difference in mortality, we have to recognize that the difference in mortality means two things. It means a difference in risk of getting disease and then a difference in risk of getting sick from disease. And those are two different sets of risks. So let's start with the difference, risk, difference in risk of getting COVID. So what happened in March of 2020? Well, what happened in March of 2020 is that this March of 2020, we declared a national emergency in this country. And we said, if you can stay home, stay home. Well, who stayed home? Who stayed home, this is the gray line, is the wealthiest 20%. Look at this extraordinary jump and the wealthiest 20% stays home. Who did not stay home? Well, who did not stay home is the least wealthy 20%. And of course, that is socioeconomically patterned and racially patterned. Let me show you this. This is the ability to work remotely from home. Uh, the ability to work remotely. Income quartile, the higher the income quartile, the more likely you are to be able to work from home. It's actually an amazing dose response relationship. This is data from our American Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, um, so when the crisis hit and this novel pathogen hit us and uh, what we need to do to protect ourselves was to stay home, it became clear who could stay home. Those who could stay home were those who were socioeconomically privileged. And uh, those of us who are socially privileged could stay home, could protect ourselves. And that, of course, determined our risk of getting COVID. And that is also racially patterned. This looks at uh, people who are employed in essential industries uh, in the US. You have Asian, white, Hispanic, and you see Black, African American, which is about 50% more likely to be employed in essential industries. So risk A, which is the risk of getting COVID, was socially patterned on your likelihood of being able to protect yourself from COVID. And that was entirely socioeconomically patterned. Risk B was your risk of having severe COVID. Now you got COVID and now it's your risk of having severe COVID. Well, what's the greatest underlying um, um, risk factor for having severity of COVID once you get COVID? And we've known this right from the beginning of the disease. That is underlying morbidity. This data from the China CDC, this was, I believe, this data, these data came out, I believe, in March of 2020. So um, it's really very early data. We've known this right from the beginning of the disease that if you have um, underlying cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, you're much more likely to have um, to die from COVID. Well, who has underlying comorbidity? Who, when COVID hit, was essentially, what were the groups that were sitting ducks for this disease that was affecting, that was making you more vulnerable if you had underlying comorbidity? Well, I'll go back, these are UK data, these are your data. Um, um, 
household income decile. The yellow line is having illness that makes you vulnerable to COVID. The more income you have, the less likely you are to have illness that makes you vulnerable to COVID. The green bar, by the way, is long-standing mental health conditions. The more income you have, the less likely you are to have mental health conditions um, before COVID. And that, of course, is consistent in your country, it's consistent in our country. In the particular context of race, focusing on the US, looking at Black American versus White American, this is um, underlying mortality in Black American, this is pre-COVID, and you see Black, White differences, Black is blue, White is red, younger ages, middle ages, older ages, higher mortality among Black Americans than White Americans, and higher morbidity among Black Americans and White Americans. See high blood pressure, young, middle age, older, um, older diabetes, young, middle age, older ages. And this, of course, reflects decades and centuries of disenfranchisement and marginalization among um, uh, Black Americans compared to white Americans in this country, which in this country traces itself back to a history of um, slavery and uh, the, um, the disenfranchisement of, um, of uh, Black Americans right from the beginning. This is a map of slavery in the United States in uh, 1860, showing the Southern states where there were, um, um, where more Africans were enslaved. Um, and um, slavery, of course, ended in the middle of the 19th century in the United States, but that did not end the marginalization of Black Americans, and that ultimately became many other forces, including um, forces like this. This is something which we call redlining. Um, uh, this is a map from 1939. This is in Detroit, an American city. And uh, what redlining was, um, was reflected a federal program. It was a federal program to encourage home ownership as part of the American government program is called the Homeowners Loan Corporation to um, encourage Americans to buy homes. Nothing wrong with that program as a way of encouraging uh, people to save. Unfortunately, the implementation of that program, this maps from 1939, was that the Homeowners Loan Corporation would take maps and they would mark the maps for lenders in a way that says uh, green areas are areas where they're safe to lend, so they're safe bets for lending, yellow areas maybe, and don't lend to people in red areas. And of course, red areas were areas where African-Americans lived, which meant that um, African-Americans were um, excluded from uh, home ownership opportunities for wealth generation, opportunities for stability, stable income, stable jobs, um, uh, stable homes, which then result in positive health. Of course, resulting then in greater comorbidity, which when COVID hit, made Black Americans at greater risk for death from COVID. So really all of this ultimately reflects decades and centuries of um, injustice that, man that manifests in health inequities. So that's what went wrong. Differential risk of getting COVID, differential underlying vulnerability to, to having a severe COVID. And then I think the question becomes, why did it all go so wrong? Why did it go so wrong? Um, uh, it's not just a matter of, it's not good enough, I think, to say that's what went wrong. Well, why did we get it wrong? Because I think understanding why we got it wrong is important in order for us to think about what we should do right. And I think there are two reasons for why it went wrong. I think we've been underinvesting, underinvesting in what makes us healthy, and we've been underinvesting in um, what could keep us healthy if, a, if another pandemic happens. Let's start with the first one. Let's start in underinvesting what makes us healthy. And to uh, make this case, I'll tell the story. This is a story of uh, um, uh, Blind Willie Johnson. Um, he's an American blues singer, and some of you may be fans of the blues, you might know his name. Uh, he was born in Texas, which is a southern U.S. state in the turn of the 20th century, so 1900s. He was born sighted, but the story is that he lost his vision in a domestic violence incident um, as a child. So he grew up poor, black, blind in Texas in the 1900s, learned how to play the guitar, and um, he's um, made a living busking, which is playing on the street corner. Not a very good living, as you can imagine. But um, blind Willie Johnson got married, got living in a house, his house burned down in an accident. He, him and his wife didn't, um, weren't hurt in the, in the fire, but they didn't have any money. So when the fire burned, finished burning, they went back to living in the house that had burned down, um, um, sort of in the burnt out husk of the house. In his early 40s, um, um, Blind Willie Johnson got malaria. This is Texas in 1940s, Southern United States in 1940s. Malaria was actually quite common. Our Centers for Disease Control, which uh, you may have heard of, is our, is our largest um, um, it's our federal center of, um, of um, disease control, infectious control, et cetera, um, was actually started to help control malaria in our southern states. And um, so not that uncommon, he got malaria. His wife took him to hospital and he was turned away from hospital. Not clear if he was turned away because he was poor, because he was black, he was because, because he was blind. And then he died. And the, the question I ask about Blind Willie Johnson is, well, what killed Blind Willie Johnson? And well, what killed him was malaria. But of course, it wasn't just malaria, right? When I tell the story, you can tell the reason what also killed him was racism and poverty and homelessness and domestic violence and uh, poor access to care. All those things also killed him. 
And the story of Blind Willie Johnson, what it does is it forces us to say, well, what kills us? Well, it certainly was malaria. Had he received treatment for his malaria, he would have lived. But it wasn't just malaria. Had he, had he treated his malaria, something else would have gotten him the next day. He would have died of pneumonia the next day, or he would have died of COVID the next day, right? So our mistake in terms of underinvestment and what makes us healthy is that we keep investing all our money in malaria. And I go back to where I started, which is what did we get right in COVID? Vaccines, something we got right in COVID. And vaccines is treatment de facto for the particular epidemic. That is a good thing. It's a good thing that we're investing in. We want treatment for malaria. We want vaccines for COVID. But that in and of itself is never going to be enough. And in fact, we keep making this mistake over and over again. This uh, infographics from a Center for Clinical Systems Improvement shows a, a, a I mean, it's a very simplified version of what causes health, saying medicine, healthcare, about 20%, health behaviors, tobacco use, diet, 30%, physical environment, 10%, education, job status, family support, 40%. That's fine. This is largely uncontroversial. I can show this to any number of medical audiences. People don't generally disagree with this. But of course, that's not where we spend our money. This is US spending. The figure on the left is the same as the color figure I showed you before. Physical environment, 10%, medicine, 20%, health behaviors, 30 so same with factors, 40 But our spending, 90% of our spending is all about our medicine. And in fact, that has resulted in the country I live in, the United States, in a much more expensive healthcare system than any other high-income country. These are other high-income countries. This is the US. This is our spending on health and healthcare. And in fact, our spending on healthcare, which is the blue bar here, continues to improve while all our other spending continues to go down. In the US, that has resulted in us having lower life expectancy than all other high-income countries by about five years. And in fact, we are an outlier as a country in that uh, this is our spending, this is life expectancy. You see all the other high income countries, including the United Kingdom, um, uh, your spending goes up, life expectancy goes up, while well, spending goes this way here, and our life expectancy does not go up. So that's the kind of country that we have had in terms of our underinvestment of what keeps us healthy. I am acutely aware when I'm, I'm saying that I'm speaking to uh, an audience in Scotland, and I know that um, there are very different social norms and there are very different uh, social political priorities uh, in a country that has a much stronger, at least in my assessment from the outside, um, um, perspective on um, social safety net than does the United States. But I suspect that there are echoes of this as well in what you've experienced in the time of COVID, which is an underinvestment in what fundamentally makes us healthy. The other underinvestment is in what may have helped. Well, what may have helped, of course, is investment in public health, investment in public health infrastructure, which is the opposite of what we've been doing. In this country, our state and local public health workforces have shrunk. That's our local and our state, and uh, you see the number of uh, uh, people who have um, working um, in these areas has gone down. Um, uh, most states in this country spend less than $100 per person in public health. Um, this looks at, sort of shows you what where um, the density of the color where more states spend. And although there has been a lot of talk about um, spending more on public health, for example, this is originally enacted funding in a federal um, uh, prevention public health fund, we actually always end up spending less. Public health funds always get siphoned away. Um, um, and uh, we've had a drop in expenditure per resident in most states. In fact, in most American states, um, we spend more on policing than we spend on uh, public health. The red is spending on policing, the blue is spending on non-hospital health. And what you see is in most of the country, we spend more on policing than we do on public health, which of course has echoes going back to the civil unrest that emerged from the uh, police shooting of an armed black men and women, tying in then with the greater vulnerability that uh, Black Americans in particular face in a moment of COVID, and you can put the whole thing together, and you see that we created an unholy stew that was really a tinderbox ready to go up in flames when a pandemic hit, which is exactly what happened. So it's, it's hard to say being positive about the past year and a half, about the tremendous loss of life and um, the burdens that COVID has imposed on the world. But I do think that we have a responsibility to um, think about what silver linings can we extract? What can we learn from the moment? How can we seize the opportunity to create a better world? Now there's multiple different ways of looking at this. And uh, I have written about this notion of needing a health new deal. And, uh, and I, I, I would argue that creating a health new deal is uh, fundamentally, fundamentally um, uh, undoing the forces that we're talking about, that I've just been talking about, about investing in what makes us healthy, investing in the forces that can keep us healthy, both investing in infrastructure, public health, but also investing in education and stable employment and stable housing and opportunities for everybody to have fair, livable wages. All of that is fundamentally what keeps us healthy. The good news is 
that um, there is um, confidence in scientists in this country that uh, um, uh, has actually remained pretty robust. And I'm not sure that we've actually earned some of this confidence, but uh, um, um, what you see is confidence in scientists and medical scientists has actually continued to go up in this country. And I think it puts us in a position to um, work on making a better scientific case and making a moral case for what the world needs, for how the world needs to invest in what makes us healthy and invest in what can keep us healthy in the context of the pandemic by producing the evidence and producing the knowledge that can inform action. Fundamentally, in this little schema here, where we want to be is up here. We want to be producing evidence that is also aligned with the moral values of societies, evidence that tells us what to do that is aligned with moral values of society and help navigate those values to align with the knowledge about what can inform action to create a healthier country. Now, I could stop here. I could stop here and I could say that, uh, and, uh, and sort of leave this as a, a sort of a motivational rah-rah for us all to say, this is what we should be doing together. But I do think that um, it's not good enough. And in the context of a, um, of a seminar um, uh, hosted by um, Center on Population Health, I do think it's important to say, Having said that, having said that this is our agenda, that we need a health new deal, that there's public confidence in scientists, that we can actually play an active role in generating knowledge and generating uh, the values that align for society to, to head in the right direction. I think part of what has to emerge from COVID is um, self-reflection to say, how can we do better? How can we do this job better? So I do want to, as I move towards my conclusion, to talk about how we can do ever better science towards generating better evidence aligned with societal moral values. And I wanna talk about some of the mistakes that I think we've been making in science in the context of COVID and uh, why we've been making those mistakes. Again, in the context of illuminating what we can do better and creating an agenda for public health in the context of COVID. So I'm gonna have better science. I wanna talk about um, paying attention to avoiding false certitude, to acknowledge contradiction and to tolerate disagreement. And I just wanna briefly talk about each of them. I wanna talk about, uh, let me start with false certitude. And uh, you know, I could talk a lot about this, um, um, you have your own cases in um, Scotland and the UK, uh, just as we have in the US. A lot of this um, has uh, taken the form of um, extraordinarily, extraordinarily um, um, uh, confident um, scientific prediction, particularly around modeling early in the pandemic and subsequently in all matters of pandemic, um, um, that has, um, where science has uh, adopted a mien of certitude about the right answer, when in fact, when in fact, the right answer that's uh, about something as complex as COVID has to embed the multiple layers of um, socioeconomic circumstance and uh, changing daily realities together with a pathogen that we don't understand that um, should have given us far more humility than we have had in science. This is from a paper by uh, Dr. Soltesh, which I like, which says, with a lot of stake, it's wise to be humble when faced with fundamental limitations. Dynamic models are usable as long as they take into account the uncertainty of the assumptions of which they are based in the data they are led by. If this is not the case, the results are on a par with assumptions or guesses. Now, most modelers actually know this, and most of us in science actually know this, but we have not behaved as a scientific community in a way as though we know this. We have been, uh, um, we have rushed headlong into the uh, media fray, um, uh, projecting certitude that has actually fundamentally um, uh, waylaid a lot of decision-making processes. And I do think it's actually time for us to own up to that. In particular, this is from a paper that recently came out where it shows actually, whereas people do perceive greater uncertainty when it's communicated, only, there's only a small decrease, d decrease in trust in numbers and trustworthiness of the source when we admit uncertainty, which actually means that we have the opportunity in science to say a new pandemic happens, we are uncertain, and that's okay. And that is something that we have done very little of in science. Second is to acknowledge contradiction. Um, um, we, have, um, um, uh, we have had multiple um, contradictions, um, uh, and uh, we have been very hesitant to acknowledge contradiction. In fact, we've been... Uh, sort of largely um, uh, trying to get rid of contradiction. This is, um, we started off in the US by saying you don't need a mask to avoid the coronavirus. Um, of course, that then resulted in uh, changing changing, and then deleting tweets and uh, about uh, mask wearing is an effort, um, which I would argue to be misguided um, uh, to, um, um, uh, to sort of not confuse people. But in fact, uh, what we ended up doing, we end up doing is um, leading people down a garden path of saying that um, there is a, um, uh, certitude in what we know and we never contradict ourselves. And third, perhaps least popular, is tolerating disagreement. We have been terrible at tolerating disagreement as a scientific community. Um, um, there has been a hegemony in public health thinking, um, uh, particularly aligned with particular political parties 
Um, and I don't think this serves us well. I thought this sort of particularly um, emerged uh, most strongly around when the Great Barrington Declaration emerged, which I know scientists from all over the world signed, including from the UK, um, which was roundly reviled by uh, mainstream science, um, um, including things like this from Union of Concerned Scientists, calling it hurting people to slaughter the dangerous fringe theory behind the Great Barrington Declaration. Um, um, and it is in no way, by the way, defense of the Great Barrington Declaration, it's simply to say, that um, these are some of the statements in the Great Barrington Declaration that says adopting measures to protect the vulnerable should be central aim of COVID-19. Nursing home staff should use staff with acquired immunity and perform frequent testing. Staff rotation should be minimized. Retired people living at home should have groceries delivered. Comprehensive detailed list of measures, including multi-generation households can be implemented, et cetera. It's a lot that makes sense in uh, something that was, um, that was roundly rejected by science and being essentially called as killing people. I'll show you another example of this. This is uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia school reopening plan is put on hold after an outcry. We should not have to teach students to death. That we have actually allowed no space for disagreement, no space for contradiction, uh, no space for uncertainty in science. And uh, in part, I realize because we have uh, felt the pressure to solve this very pressing problem. It's a public health problem. It is our moment. But I think in the process, we have not served our cause well, fundamentally being the cause of providing providing guidance on emerging set of moral values, emerging set of data that can inform our way through a complex set of circumstances that are in infectious disease intersecting with underlying underinvestments in, in how we structure our society and how we keep ourselves up. And uh, I'll end with what has challenged these approaches, what has challenged what I think has been what used to be our science business as usual. Um, uh, it's three things. When we deal with complex systems, our biases and our arrogance sometimes. And uh, I think it's important that we actually reckon with these as um, we start emerging um, by God's grace from COVID. Let me start about complexity. And I'll start with uh, perhaps one of the most touchy issues in context of COVID, which is education. I'll show you American education data. Um, um, this is um, grades three to four, grade to eight. This is essentially primary school in the American system. Um, and these are math scores. The pink are pre-COVID, the green are year of COVID. You see how the curves are shifted to the left. All kids are learning less, but it's not all kids learning less. As we shut down schools, in fact, it's kids, it's schools um, for kids of color who are learning less. The dark dots are kids of color, the blue dots are uh, white students. And you see the separation of math achievement scores from K all the way to grade five. Schools in more affluent areas were faster to reopen than those in low income communities. And all of this in the context where uh, mortality rate per uh, children uh, for children has been very, very low. In fact, it's been uh, more unsafe for kids to drive to school than it, which in America most kids do, that is for kids to be in school. And of course, all of this is in the context of um, the evidence. The evidence is abundantly clear that if there's one thing that we can do to actually make people healthy in the long term is um, to educate them. This looks at uh, mortality by education. This looks at different racial groups in the US, Latino, black, white, just focus on white. And what you see is these are people with less than eight years of education deal with more than 16 years of education, dramatic drop in mortality over time. So by so the, the closure of schools driven as a public health measure, even in the context of uh, low evidence of transmission for kids and for teachers, um, uh, is um, resulting fundamentally in lower educational attainment, particularly kids who are disadvantaged, which is going to translate in a lifetime of uh, consequences. That is a really complex system. That calls for caution, humility, disagreement and real careful thought in science. And I don't think we have shown that, which of course, it's no question it results in things like this. And this is actually from, uh, from the UK. And I think we in science tend to dismiss this as, uh, as uh, um, uh, people who are not enlightened the way we are, which of course is simply false. Um, our biases, we bring a lot of biases to this and uh, I'll talk about American biases and uh, you can all uh, again apply whether or not this applies to um, Scotland or biases of privileged perspectives. Um, um, American academics, American public health people, and, and specifically, but talk about academics generally, are left of center. Um, um, much more, um, and this is uh, this looks at professors, associate professors, assistant professors. This is the left. This is actually where we all live. We're sort of a little bit to left, in the middle. Really, very few academics are to the right. Um, and what's actually interesting is if you look at from the green to the blue, we become more left as we go up the academic ladder. Now, why does it matter? Does it matter for our perspectives? I mean, you could say, well, we're more left, we're more enlightened, we're more progressive, we're thinking ahead, so it's good for society. Well, who has done well in society in time of COVID? Now, I know COVID has been bad, but I'll show you perhaps the most unpopular slide of all. This looks at uh, mental health, personal finance, job security, take-home pay, physical health, personal life, work-life balance. 
Above here is improved and down here it's worsened. And this is divided by various groups, all adults, et cetera, et cetera. The only group with consistent improvement is this, which is the group with postgraduate education. Groups with postgraduate education improve their mental health, personal finances, job security, take-home pay, physical health, personal life, work-life balance. That's the group. The other group here is group more than 100, 100, makes more than 100K a year, which of course overlaps a lot with group with postgraduate education. This is us. And I really do think it's important for us to actually keep our, um, our biases and privileges um, in mind as we try to navigate the post-COVID uh, public health and to say, how is it they're recognizing this privilege that we might actually have uh, done different things and thought differently in the context of COVID? I'll just show you epidemiology. This is epidemiology, which is my discipline in the United States. Epidemiology is, uh, um, is um, 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 more than three quarters white or Asian in the United States, very little um, Latino or black. And of course, epidemiology has been the leading voice in a lot of the um, uh, response around COVID. And I always have to feel like we have to challenge ourselves to say, how does that affect the um, perspectives of science in the context of uh, COVID? And finally, epistemic arrogance. Um, um, and by epistemic arrogance, I mean um, this tendency to overestimate our ability to predict when we're overconfident in our knowledge. And I do think we've been overconfident in science. And I think um, recognizing the, that there have been real problems, I think um, in the interest of uh, being honest with interrogating ourselves and interrogating not just society, which is what I sort of did in two thirds of my talk, but I want to end my last third by saying we should interrogate the science to say, uh, um, uh, how should we do things differently? And it's been difficult not to actually be arrogant because uh, this is um, what's been happening in our newspapers. You know, there's been a series of these, it's in the New York Times, what hundreds of epidemiologists are doing for Thanksgiving, what they're doing for Christmas, what they're doing for summer break. It's made epidemiologists and public health professionals feel pretty good. But of course, um, you take the long view, you know that uh, this comes and goes. This is another cartoon. It says, oh, it was so typically brilliant of you to have invited an epidemiologist. Um, uh, but of course, this cartoon is from 2001, which was after a September 11 terrorist attacks. And that, of course, faded very quickly. So I think we are at a moment of opportunity in science where uh, we recognize that um, there were a lot of underlying societal issues. We've underinvested in what makes us healthy. We've underinvested in forces that can keep us healthy. We're a moment of opportunity to argue for a health new deal, to argue for uh, a rethink of how we engage with, um, with health. But to do that, we also need to make sure that we look carefully at our science and make sure that we actually approach things with the appropriate, the, the that are truly complex with the appropriate humility and that we help focus society on what matters. Um, I'll end, this is my uh, book, Con Contagion Next Time, which is coming out in November, which roughly is uh, the thesis of this talk, which really says, uh, um, uh, talks about the fundamental foundational forces that we need to focus on, that it is never going to be enough for us to focus just on treatment, just on medicines. And similarly, in order to achieve that mission and to fulfill that promise, we need to collectively as a science be better at what we're doing um, with the honesty and humility to tackle difficult, complex problems. I will stop there. It's really a privilege to be here with you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Sandro. Uh, I'm really sorry that the rest of the audience can't show their appreciation uh, due to the format, but um, I hope I reflect their, their views when I say how valuable it's been to have those reflections on the past 18 months and to have you pull together so many threads of how we've got to where we are uh, and how we move forward. And, and in particular to hear the detail from the US uh, and identify many of the commonalities with our situation here and some of the important differences as well, and uh, both personally and professionally um, interesting to hear the complexity around about children's health and education identified there, um, which is a, uh, yeah, a highly visible issue for us right now. Um, so I'm going to ask our panelists to join us um, by switching on their videos uh, and, and microphones when it's their turn to speak, and I'll, I'll introduce them. Um, joining us now, we have uh, Vital Katikaredi, Professor of Public Health and Health Inequalities at the MRC Social and Public Health Sciences Unit uh, at the University of Glasgow. Uh, we have Peter Kelly, uh, Director of the Poverty Alliance, and Kat Smith uh, of the School of Social Work and Social Policy at the University of Strathclyde. Um, so we have uh, just over half an hour remaining uh, for the session, and the plan is to uh, hand over to our panellists to offer some reflections uh, and uh, an opportunity for some question and answer uh, with Sandro. So first I will hand over to Vital. Thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to join you, uh, and I'd just like to say uh, a real thanks to uh, Sandro for such an enlightening talk. Um, so uh, I'll probably leave uh, discussion about uh, the uh, the role of scientists to Kat Smith, um, who is an expert on that topic, and um, I'll 
I'll start by uh, maybe picking up some of the relevance to Scotland. Um, so uh, I think many of the themes that, uh, that were discussed are, are clearly relevant to both the UK and Scotland. Um, so especially issues around socioeconomic inequality and the social patterning of COVID harms. Um, but there, ha there are some kind of interesting differences. So uh, one of the areas that we found that we're, we've probably been quite far behind within Scotland is actually on looking at ethnic inequalities in COVID. And part of that relates to the, the data that are collected within Scotland and the data quality available. So unlike the, uh, the US, which has a long history of actually collecting information by race, uh, in Scotland, we've been um, slightly behind the curve on that. And it's, uh, but we are seeing the similar patterns of harm, uh, but the actual explanations of that are, are, are probably still uh, a, a bit more hidden. Um, and there's uh, interesting historical differences in health patterns as well. So in relation to outcomes like life expectancy and all-cause mortality, it's actually been the case that often ethnic minority groups have had uh, better outcomes than the white Scottish majority group in Scotland, um, with the pandemic really marking a, a big reversal of uh, what's happened before. Um, but some of the, the things that have been flagged, like the role of occupation, are probably really important in Scotland, uh, as well as issues around housing and so forth. Um, I apologise, I live near a, a hospital, and uh, in case you can hear it, there's a helicopter that's just flying past, um, so apologies if that's picking up. Um, in relation to some of the, um, the employment issues that Sandro picked up, um, the, the UK is probably at a slightly different phase in some of those employment impacts actually um, uh, passing through to uh, through the economy. Um, so one of the things that uh, to celebrate some of the UK's successes um, that the UK did well was actually introduce a furlough scheme and try to keep people within the, the the within their jobs with the government picking up the bill for uh, keeping people in employment. So actually uh, the, the high levels of job loss haven't yet filtered through fully, um, but there's a real risk that as we're in the phase now when the furlough scheme is ending, that actually uh, we could experience quite a, a, a marked shock in, uh, in terms of people's employment especially hitting the, uh, the, the most disadvantaged in society. And Scotland, like the US, has also experienced its own mortality uh, challenges even before the pandemic. So we've seen um, an underinvestment in what makes us healthy with uh, austerity policies leading to quite marked cuts uh, to the, the social safety net that had been in place, uh, including within care homes and so forth. Uh, another theme that I want to pick up on is issues of uh, health and social care disruption as well. So um, the, the UK and uh, Scotland as well uh, has been fortunate in having a universal health system, um, but that's been under considerable pressure um, and, and probably unprecedented pressure in terms of the unmet healthcare needs uh, that have been built up over the last uh, 20 months or so. And there's some evidence that uh, that need is uh, disproportionately unmet amongst ethnic minority groups and amongst disadvantaged social groups. So there's a real risk of um, exacerbating health inequalities uh, if we're not, if we don't have a proactive health system response. Um, as many of you are probably aware, uh, many uh, health staff, but also social care staff uh, are absolutely exhausted by uh, working on the front line in the pandemic response. Um, and we're, we were in a situation of relative staff shortages 
uh, probably exacerbated by Brexit, um, even before the pandemic. And there's a, a real challenge of maintaining staff retention and how we uh, do that, particularly in the social care, which has been uh, a neglected sector in the UK, is, is, is probably an important priority going forward. Now, the, the last thing I'd like to bring up is, um, having spoken a bit more about a local perspective, is to take a slightly global perspective. So um, being in Glasgow, um, obviously we're thinking forward to the, the really important COP summit coming up in a couple of months and uh, thinking about how we address the climate emergency. And as Sandra has pointed out, there's potentially the opportunity of uh, seizing the, the COVID pandemic opportunity to really make uh, radical changes to economic and social systems that are needed not just to as we emerge from the pandemic, but also to address the climate emergency. So um, how we actually seize that opportunity and uh, do things like investing in a, a Green New Deal instead of a resumption to austerity policies is, is something which uh, I think is uh, worth considering and something I'd like to kind of pick up uh, as, a, as a question for Sandro is, um, what do you think we need to do as a kind of global public health community to address the climate emergency? And especially in the context of us having probably not stepped up adequately to address the vaccine inequity issues that we've been seeing. So how do we actually uh, encourage all countries to play a part in addressing the climate emergency and are there lessons from what's happened with vaccination. So um, I'll stop there and hopefully Linda uh, either are we do you want Sandra to respond now or are we yeah, happy to, to, to run it as a discussion and come back in there if there's anything you, you would like to step in on this, Sandra, if you have any specific questions to raise, Vital, um, or we can hand over to Peter as you wish. Sandra? Um, let, let's get the, the whole panel and then we can, we can distill in a couple. I mean, I, I could say a lot of things, but uh, I fear <laughs> then we leave no time for Peter and Kat. So it's, uh, let, let, let's move on and then we'll. Okay. So, Peter, I invite you in there. Oh, we've got a technical issue, we can't hear you again. No, it's still not. Should be able to hear me now. We can now, fantastic. Good, sorry, um, as I explained earlier, getting used to my office-based technology again. So thank you, Sandro, for a, a fantastic uh, contribution, a really comprehensive overview of, of what's happened in the states over the last 18 months and and i think as as vital has already said you know there are uh, very similar um themes and issues in the uk and i guess what i want to do is, is pick up on some of those similarities and maybe pick up on also the themes around investment and and what we did right and maybe just finishing very briefly and i'll try to be very brief around that question of the opportunity and whether uh, what the opportunity is that we have at the moment and where we're where, whether we're likely to be able to take it so i think in in scotland we went into um uh the pandemic as a deeply divided society much like uh, the us um a million children a million people in scotland living in poverty two hundred thirty thousand children living in poverty in scotland and and we know that the the patterns of who's affected uh, by low income uh, are very clear. Um, disabled people, um, women, particularly lone parents, far more likely to be affected by poverty. People um, uh, from black and ethnic minority uh, communities also at higher risk of poverty. So those patterns, very similar, I think, um, to the US. And I think Vital has already mentioned the importance of austerity and I think uh, it, it goes to the heart of that question of investment and, uh, and what we invest in and what we've prioritised, not just now and not just what we, we may do in the future, but what we've done over the last 
decade and, and how that maybe um, perhaps inhibits or sets the tone for what might be possible in the future. So I'm, I'm kind of giving away some of my, my fears at the moment. So we've gone through a, a decade of austerity in the UK, and that's undoubtedly weakened our ability to uh, respond to, to COVID and to be resilient in the face of the pandemic. So our, our social security system, the, uh, the area I guess that I know best, um, was repeatedly undermined uh, during the last decade, particularly since 2013 onwards, we've had um, repeated free freezes in key social security benefits that meant that our, our main um, unemployment benefit in the UK had the lowest replacement ratio of, of any system in, in Europe. So, so while, Sandro, you're correct that there are many parts of our, our system uh, that are to be lauded and that we, we need to be proud of, we have fundamentally undermined some of those, those aspects over the last decade. Our labour market, which again we've, we've already touched on, um, also ensured that some people were more were put at greater risk um, during the pandemic than others, as, as Sandro has, has uh, illustrated already. So the endemic levels of, of low pay in Scotland and across the UK, the increasing levels of insecurity uh, and, and insecure forms of work have put more people at risk, have, have led them to be living um, very uh, insecure uh, lives. And then finally, our public services, which I think overall have made an incredible response, not just our, our, our health services, but across the piece, our public services have made an incredible response um, in our communities and supporting people um, uh, pivoting to delivering services in entirely different ways, whether that's online or or emergency relief in, in some of the early stages of the pandemic. But I think if we consider uh, the impact of austerity on those public services over the last 10 years, and we think about what could have been and how those services could have been um, uh, more able to, to make a response, then we might not have had some of the impact that we've had now. But but looking towards the future, in terms of the public health response, I think this is where I especially want to pick up on that, that theme of investment that Sandro explored. So one of the things that, that we did do right in the UK, alongside the furlough scheme, which I think um, is, is incredibly important, is important not just in terms of the jobs that it protected and the incomes that it supported and still supports at this point, at this point, but it also showed what um, was possible, that the state was able to mobilise and invest significantly and have a real immediate significant impact, something which I think over the last perhaps 30, 40 years, we've increasingly started to doubt the ability and the role of the state to intervene in that way. So, so furlough scheme was important in what it achieved, but also what it symbolised. The, the other things that we, the other thing that we did to write in the UK was we immediately recognised the UK government immediately recognised the inadequacies of the social security system. So after uh, seven or eight years of consistent cuts, there was an immediate change in approach, an increase to universal credit, the the, the system of, of the basic system of of unemployment support and in work support now. Um, and increased that by over a thousand pounds a year, effectively a thousand pounds a year. And so, so those are things that we did right, and those symbolize perhaps where we could go. I guess at the moment, I don't feel tremendously optimistic. So uh, maybe a year ago, there was some cause for optimism. I think now we, we stand on the threshold of seeing, as Vital has said, the furlough scheme abandoned when perhaps it may well be needed most. Um, that uplift to universal credit is about to be withdrawn. So we'll see what was one of the biggest increases in social security turn into one of the biggest post-war cuts in social security. So I think um, what, what we've seen over the last year and a half is the absolutely vital role of the way that we uh, invest in our social protection system, uh, the nature of our labour market, 
these are fundamental to determining whether our, our public health responses are effective. These, these flank our public health responses and ensure uh, or, or determine to, some, to a large extent uh, their effectiveness. So I think we are at a critical point now. I think the need for investment in those kind of services is clearer than ever. I think the public acceptance of the need for that investment is very clear, but it's very far from clear for me that we have translated that acceptance of that need into a political priority. And I guess that's the that's the question that I leave is how do we turn this evidence about what is required into an effective uh, political priority, which is where we, we are now. Thank you, Peter. Um, and I think both you and Vital have really helpfully brought out some of the commonalities and also some of the specifics of where we currently stand in Scotland and the UK um, and how we might start to turn our minds to addressing these. Um, so before we come back to Sandra, I'll ask Kat uh, Smith to come in. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much. Um, and yeah, my thanks to Sandra for a really interesting presentation. Um, yeah, there's lots, lots fitted in there. It was packed full of things and there was lots of overlap with them. Um, an, an unequal pandemic book that I co-authored with Claire Bramber and Julia Lynch. So unsurprisingly, I completely agree. We need to um, focus on the inequalities that we've seen exacerbated and highlighted by COVID-19. And then we need to think about those in their historical and social political contexts. Um, so it was great to see that being highlighted. I also agree we need to be focusing then on why we haven't done better in trying to tackle those inequalities, because I think for those of us who've been looking at inequalities over the last few decades, unfortunately, what we saw with COVID-19 was completely predictable um, in terms of the yeah, massive increase in inequalities. So it was, it was really good to see this. It was also really good to see the attention you drew to self-reflection on people involved in the research and um, in terms of their positionality and privilege and how that might kind of give a particular and a, sometimes a narrow perspective. So that's where I wanna pick the conversation up, which is much as Vital predicted. Um, but I'm keen to broaden a little and it's, um, I'm keen to broaden it in ways that I think reflect the content of some of Sandro's slides, which to me at least, clearly emphasise the importance of history and politics and sociology. As when we talk about science, we sometimes use it as a shorthand for work undertaken by academics and universities. Sometimes we mean empirical research undertaken in a range of different sectors. And sometimes we only mean empirical research emanating some, from some very specific disciplines that use very particular methods. So when we talk about reflecting on how we do better science, I'm not sure we're always talking about the same set of activities, or at least I think there's different conversations going on. And in my view, if I think about the UK context, part of the problem with how we've tackled um, COVID-19 is, um, and, and of course there are some positives here too, but also some similar um, limitations, I think. So for me, part of the problem uh, in how we've done this is that the way we've thought about how science can help policymakers and society respond has taken a very narrow view of science. So it, at least for the first year, the kind of science that was emphasized was very much biomed biomedical scientists and statistical disciplines, especially modeling in the UK. And that makes a lot of sense of as many of the questions that policymakers had can be answered by those disciplines and using those methods. Um, but it does, as Paul Kearney reflects, means that in the UK context, when policymakers talked about being guided by the science, they typically meant our scientists, which was a small group of government scientific advisors who were either employed in government or like on official committees and were insiders in various ways. Appearances suggest that many of these experts share a relatively narrow set of cultural and demographic backgrounds, which is something Sandra was flagging in the US too. So put bluntly, I'd say, although substantive in number, the scientific superstars that have emerged in the UK in the context of COVID appear to be predominantly well-off white scientists from high-income Anglophone settings who've trained in disciplines that promote broadly positivist epistemolo epistemologies. Beyond this, the more influential advisors are those who understand and are willing to follow the rules of the game. So they're working as, uh, as policy insiders to an extent, and, and that limits the extent to which they offer criticism, at least in public. So that relatively narrow set of advisors almost inevitably results in a relatively narrow set of scientific advice. And that's been a key criticism of the UK's approach. And missing from this, and much less well-featured, are voices that bring expertise from, say, ethics, the humanities, the social sciences, um, and so on. I'm, I'm not the only one to point that out. So I think the problems of having this really narrow 
approach to science have been multiple. But just to give three examples, the fairly disastrous approach we had in the UK around PPE, so protective um, equipment and outfits for staff, needed advisors who understood procurement, supply chain management, logistics, and voices who recognised that frontline workers were actually really diverse. People working in care home settings, um, cleaners, porters, as well as doctors and nurses, and so on. To avoid substantial increases in social and educational inequalities and worsening mental health among children and young people, another area in which the UK doesn't seem to be doing particularly well, policy decisions around school closures needed to be informed by a really broad array of expertise, including social workers, child psychologists, child behavioural experts, sociologists of education, families, and so on. And to be well positioned to overcome the unequal impacts of COVID-19, including the wealth of misinformation um, that, that's had a really unequal effect in the US and the UK, um, scientific experts in the UK needed to represent or at least be engaging with much more a much more diverse demographic spectrum. And instead in the UK, what we saw was 10 black academics calling for a review of a, one of our main funders systems and processes after it emerged that none of the principal investigators on COVID-19 grants awarded for research into death rates among people from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds were themselves black and claims that working class voices have been routinely sidelined. And all of this is made much worse by the very limited demographic engage, democratic engagement we've seen around research and policy making on COVID-19. So while scientific advisors can help decision makers think about and understand major societal problems such as pandemics, but also climate change, they also need to be, feel confident that the policy proposals they're considering will attain sufficient democratic legitimacy. And it's he, here is another um, area in which I think the UK has done not very well. And it's despite the fact that we've had a huge amount of work over the past two decades to try and improve evidence uh, in policy, evidence use in policy, and a huge amount of work to try and improve stakeholder engagement. But what we're really lacking, I feel, is, is work that tries to bring researchers, policymakers, and publics all into conversation. And we could see early on in the UK decision making um, that there were some, um, mis some misperceptions of what the public would and wouldn't accept that inf then informed the modelling that led us down a path that was um, not particularly helpful. So, so reflecting on all of that, I think my reflections the UK experience have a lot of overlap with what Sandro has said about the US context and um, in terms of the narrowness of people doing the scientific research but what I wanted to ask Sandra was about whether you also see similar issues in terms of the narrowness of the disciplines involved um, and the kind of areas of expertise being drawn on and if so um, what what do you think we can do about that it's not, like notoriously difficult to work across the kind of silos of academic disciplines but how do you think we can progress that and, and do you feel like I feel that, that that's really key for many of the challenges and my second question is around uh, the concerns about democratic engagement so I, I'm keen to know whether you feel that there are similar issues there in the US I suspect that maybe you do but based on what you said about the that we shouldn't dismiss the kind of protests of certain groups against some of the measures against COVID-19 but we should rather seek to understand them and but if you do agree with that what do you think we as researchers can do about that and how might we better support democratic engagement in conversations about evidence for policy thanks Kat um, plenty to go out in there. Uh, just to manage uh, our time, we have around about 10 minutes left for, for discussions. Any reflections from you, Sandra, or any, any follow-up points from our panel as well? Yeah, so let me, let me just make a few reflections. So first of all, thank you, um, um, uh, Vital, Peter, and uh, Kat, if I may. Um, uh, let me just make a couple of comments. Maybe I'll work backwards, um, uh, just uh, because uh, Kat's comments were uh, uh, different, slightly different than uh, Peter's and Vital. So Kat, to your uh, comments, you... Uh, I think you correctly surmise what I'm going to answer. Um, um, when um, about um, about eight months into the pandemic, I went to a funder and I said, um, my fundamental premise is that uh, COVID is going to be a triumph of the natural sciences and an abject failure of the social sciences. Allow me to investigate this. The funder said, oh my God, I can't think about that. All I care about is about uh, vaccines. And uh, so I realized it was, it was too soon. Um, but I think that's actually been borne out. I, I'm not saying that in terms of patting myself on the back saying I was right. I actually think that that's exactly what's, what's been happening. And Kat, I really, really liked how um, I, I hadn't I hadn't sharpened my thoughts enough to talk about uh, what you just did, which is um, that there has been a privileging of a particular form of science over another. And I really appreciate you teaching me that. Thank you. Uh, because that's exactly what has happened. And of course, you saw it reflected in some of my critiques of uh, of our uh, false certitude. But it, um, uh, I think a, 
a, a, a really useful nuance to that. It wasn't just false certitude. It was a, it was a certitude and over-reliance of one particular form of science. The, um, in, in some respects, the question of democratization is a corollary of that, right? It's uh, because um, the, uh, the opening up of science to, uh, um, uh, to a plurality of perspectives and uh, particularly sort of uh, the, um, the, the unruly perspectives of the non-scientist is um, is dangerous and it is uh, it, yes one can call it democratic but it also challenges our uh, frames biases and um, 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 presuppositions and I, I'm really just starting to think about this and starting to wrap my brain around it but uh, I um, as with many I think COVID one of the gifts of COVID if I may use that term for for a tragedy but I do think there are gifts that come from COVID is forcing us to deal with issues that we probably should have dealt with a long time ago. And I think one of them is the relative, uh, the, the, the hegemony and uh, the, um, the heterodoxy of science that uh, excludes other voices. And, and I think a lot of that is wrapped up into who we are, into our identities, our privileges, our biases. I have a really difficult time with anybody telling me that the fact that every scientist I know has had the luxury of working from home since the beginning of COVID, that that has not affected our perspective. Now, I've said that to many scientists and I've had many of them say, oh, that's ridiculous. How could you say that? How dare you accuse me of that? And to which it actually, to me, it defeats logic that it hasn't affected me. It, it's affected me. It, it, and I know the fact that I've been able to work from home has affected how I think. So to my mind, it is foolish for us to say that it hasn't affected us. So I actually think these issues we all need to deal with. And I, I apologize, I'm actually not answering Kat's excellent comments simply because I don't have fully formed thoughts, uh, answers to them, but I actually think we're at a point where th this is exactly the kind of conversation we should be having to surface these, the, 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 these issues so that we actually deal with them. Now, moving a little bit um, backwards to Peter, to your point, I was, um, I actually thought, I thought your comments were a little bit disheartening in terms of the state of uh, um, uh, where you're at in Scotland in terms of investment and some of these things, because yeah, I must admit sort of being on this side of the pond, you know, I tend to look at Scotland in particular as uh, sort of a, as a beacon of, uh, of rational thought about uh, investment into the foundations of what makes us healthy. So to hear you say, um, well, actually, we're heading in, in rather the opposite direction um, was a little bit uh, dispiriting. Um, uh, and uh, obviously, I, I don't know the local um, social and political economy, so I, 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 I won't comment on that. But I do think that, uh, if I may, that is exactly why I think we and by we I mean collectively, the, 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 the scientific community, the public health community, need to be pushing forward the conversation that we cannot deal with the next pandemic with vaccines and biosurveillance alone. And uh, they, uh, I, I sort of had a bit of a shameless plug for my upcoming book, and, uh, but uh, the, um, the, the, the whole thesis of the book is actually that simple. It's actually that it says sort of what I said here, is that vaccines matter, biosurveillance matters, but unless we deal with the underlying forces, the next contagion, that's, the title is actually a reference to James Baldwin's great book, Fire Next Time. Um, uh, unless we deal with underlying issues, the next pandemic will happen and the exact same thing will happen again. And I actually think, now I can say that, and I suspect that Linda, Peter, Vital, Kat, we all agree on that statement. The statement that says, unless we deal with this fundamental issues, the next pandemic happens, the same thing will happen. I suspect the five of us will agree on that. But I actually think we lose sight of the fact that actually outside of this room, many don't agree with that or don't think about that, which means it's our job to convey that message. And I often feel like the, um, if not our job, then whose job is it? It actually is our job to make that point. Like if we are right, there's, there are two options, right? We're either correct about the statement, like the statement is, unless we deal with these underlying forces, next pandemic happens, same bad stuff will happen. That's the statement. Well, there are two things about it. It's either true or not. Well, we could be wrong, but let's say we're, we're not wrong, we're right. Well, then if we're right, it's our job to make sure that the world understands it. So that's my sort of my, my reflection to that. And I think um, Peter really he, he educated me in terms of the, the challenge sort of on both sides of the Atlantic in actually doing that. You know, to come uh, to, to Vital's points, and I think, uh, you know, Vital, you wove in uh, very well some of the challenges sort of in clinical care and uh, how that has sort of also intersected with uh, the uh, broader uh, population-based uh, um, uh, a phenomenon that we're seeing. And I actually think that uh, there's a lot of reckoning to be had in terms of our intersection with sort of public health scholarship, with uh, clinical medical scholarship, how we deal with these things. And the historic, there's been sort of a historic division, right, of the medicine versus public health. And uh, 
th this might be a moment for a sort of rapprochement for bringing these ideas together to the end of recognizing that you don't deal with whole society problems by fragmenting society. Ultimately, fundamentally, you need these the, the, the structures that society creates, which is medical care and public health, to, to, to point in the same direction. I'm, I'm actually optimistic about that, uh, if, just, just to end my comments on a note of optimism, because I do think that uh, there has been more movement to, you know, I could give the same talk I gave here to a medical school audience, and I find that by and large, people do agree with me in, in medicine. Now, their incentives are such that they actually don't do much with it because incentives are such that they to take them in a separate direction, but at least they're agreeing with me. And it wasn't always the case. 10 years ago, I'm not sure that actually was the case. So I do think there is a moment of opportunity to align um, uh, these forces um, to head in the same direction. Let me stop there because there's a lot in, in all three comments and, uh, and sort of take put, put it back to the panelists. Would any colleagues like to come, come back in there? Um, I, I might uh, come back in if, if that's okay briefly, um, just on some of Kat's points, which which I thought were really fascinating. And um, so I need to declare a couple of conflicts of interest here. Um, so, so firstly, I've been involved in uh, co-chairing the Scottish government group on ethnicity and COVID, uh, but I've also been uh, intermittently involved in some of the UK government's uh, scientific advice as well, SAGE, um, and in particular around ethnicity as well. Um, but one of the things that struck me was actually within the, the, the scientific advisory groups was actually the greater than expected diversity of, of disciplinary backgrounds, actually. So we did have ethicists and we did have sociologists, including sociologists of education within SAGE, for example. Um, but there felt like there was a disconnect between uh, some of the information we were providing and recommendations that were being made to what was then uh, to the kind of ultimate decisions and not all evidence was given uh, a kind of similar weight. So I think the, you know, the, the kind of modeling and maybe some of the epidemiological data um, were um, probably ended up being more influential uh, and actually there probably wasn't enough taking into account of broader disciplines. Um, but I'm not sure that necessarily meant that the, the broader disciplines weren't, weren't part of the scientific groups, because I think actually, in contrast to some other groups, they were probably more involved than I'd expected. But I, I think they, there was certainly um, maybe not enough input from a diversity of voices. Um, so it wasn't like we had a lot of different ethicists or a lot of different sociologists, but I think different disciplines were involved, uh, which, um, yeah, so just, just a kind of a reflection on that. The, um, if, if I may just uh, reflect on the reflection for a second, the and I'm really only raising more questions, right? Th th there are so many interesting questions, for example, in other countries like Australia, like, like Australia is, has been a massive social experiment. They've taken a very different approach than either the UK um, uh, or the US. And uh, you saw the Prime Minister Scott Morrison last week essentially, essentially declaring the approach they've taken a failure, um, essentially saying that, look, this is unsustainable. We can't live like this as a country. I mean, everything he's been talking about, these are all social science, humanities, ethics type questions. And uh, I think to Vital's point, um, um, what we have learned in COVID is that we have no real mechanism for sort of a vox populi approach where these different disciplines have equal voice, or do I, actually I'm pausing because of the word equal, have, have, have voice that balances 
each other out so that we can actually emerge with better answers. My, my sense was that, um, that we, we rushed headlong into a particular approach, different countries, different approaches, largely driven by a very particular perspective, largely driven, no question, by natural science modeling perspective. And uh, by the time we sort of woke up to like, whoa, we're way down this path. Was this the right, the right path? And, um, and, and we need to learn from that to do better. One of, the, one of the types of books that I'm really excited to start reading and learning from in the context of COVID is our hist historical books that dissect the January 1st to sort of April 1st, 2020 period. Because I do think that a lot happened that set us down a particular course. And, uh, and, and I want to understand what happened there so that we can actually understand how, how does the voice of ethics, how does the voice of uh, qualitative insight into community perspectives, how does the voice that actually privileges those who are already underprivileged balance out with the modeling and the modeling uncertainty voice to give us a better set of approaches. And fundamentally, you know, I don't want to fall into the trap, which I think we often fall into a scientist as saying, everything we did was terrible. Because I would like, I would like to sort of, to, 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 be, to be smarter than that and to offer productive approaches forward. And, and I don't feel like I know enough to, to know what those productive uh, uh, approaches forward, but a conversation like this is super interesting, super interesting. I do know enough to know that it's this kind of conversation that we should be having and carrying forward to, to, to keep these issues alive. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and I think a, a good point on which to end um, and wrap us up. I think it has been a hugely valuable conversation and sincere thanks to Sandro for, for, um, for leading it and to our panelists for, for contributing. I think we've covered a huge range of, of reflection on, on what has happened um, on the scale of the challenges that lie ahead of us, um, both in Scotland and globally, but we've also opened up that conversation on how, how we might step into those challenges um, and, and from our position in public health, how we need to communicate and, and move forward from here. So thank you all for your contributions today uh, and thank you to the audience for joining us. Um, before we wrap up, uh, I've got a few, few final points of housekeeping and advertising. Um, so, uh, we really welcome anyone's feedback um, on the webinar and there will be an evaluation form emailed out to you. Um, so look out for that in your inbox and provide us uh, with what feedback you can. Um, as I said, the recording of the webinar will be available in the coming weeks uh, and feel free to share that amongst your networks and colleagues. Um, there's also some upcoming events um, from Glasgow Centre for Population Health um, and the um, uh, Finns webinars are coming in September and October, um, so you can email Carol Frame at GCPH for information on those, and there's also information on the Scottfo website, um, and I think the next GCPH uh, webinar is coming up on the Wednesday 10th of November with Gary Belkin speaking on the social crisis within the climate crisis, um, which will be particularly pertinent as COP26 comes around in Glasgow then. Um, my final vote of thanks is to the staff at GCPH for facilitating the seminar and organising everything. Um, and yes, to you all for joining. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.